Hello and welcome to this, the second vlog of the second week of September 2021. Today I'm going to discuss a relatively controversial topic, or at least I perceive that this will be relatively controversial in the realm of Battletech. I don't really know that many players in Battletech, I know a couple, and I'm not like a massive online person, I'm not like visiting Reddit chat or anything like that. But I'd imagine what I am about to say is relatively contentious. So to that end, I will try to keep this objective. I'm not going to rant or complain or moan. It's just very much like a logical, I perceive a problem here. And I think this is what can be potentially done about it in the future. And again, I'm just going to try and keep it as um, like balanced as possible. Because even if there is something in this that I don't like that I'm going to talk about, I must have the appreciation that I've been out of Battletech for quite a few years. If you watch any of the previous videos that I've posted, you'll know that history, that I only came back into it relatively recently, but I've kind of come back into it in, in a big way. And I think it's going to be like my main like hobby focus going forward. And I think that gives me a little bit of credence, actually, because I'm very much the poster boy, I suppose, for... I was into Battletech when it was really popular, like in the 90s. Now, granted, I got to an age where like, I went to university and like, life got in the way. But I very much remember thinking, like, whenever I Battletech, for whatever reason, came back into my life, I'd, like, so I met someone who knew, knew what it was. There was always very much, like any discussion that I had thinking back was very much, well, Battletech's dead. You know, and I just assumed it was dead. I've talked about this in, I think, the first video that that I that I recorded about how it was, if not like on life support, it was certainly on its knees for for quite a while. And it's only over the last like two or three years that it's not just been resuscitated; it's come back with a, a huge bang. So, in a sense, I suppose I'm coming from quite a a good standpoint in terms of like that companies can that catalysts can look at and say and have that analysis of why did this person come back to Battletech? Like what was it that like drew them back in? Whereas if you've been playing it like solidly since nineteen eighty six, then you've seen the good times and the bad times and I'm sure you'll be able to kind of, you know, point like the highlights and the low lights and, and things like that. But you were never kind of aware for any amount of time where you've got that, I suppose, like that coldness to it because it's always been like omnipresent in your life. At least that's how I'd look at it. I mean, there's another way to look at that as well, which is I have no right to discuss this because I came out of Battletech uh, as a thing for, for so long. But, you know, I, I think we have to kind of move beyond that mindset because if somebody challenged what I'm about to say here, I'd be like, Yep, that's completely fair. You know, like you, <laughs> you have your opinion. That's great. Um, you know, do do a vlog about it, or write a blog about it, or you know, post on whatever forum about it, about what you think about it. Because I think the more data that companies like Catalyst get, not just Catalyst, but anyone else who's involved with the uh, the BattleTech IP, the more like good data that they get back, the better decisions they'll be ma be able to make about the direction the game goes in and the, all the, the, the lore and the, the narratives going, because it very much looks at face value, and I don't think anyone would really dispute this, at least I've never seen anyone dispute this, that Battletech very much is a game run by fans, made by, uh, sorry, run and developed by fans for fans. And that's a huge thing, right? Like that, that doesn't happen. In, in a lot of instances. You've usually got like, um, it might be like a, a sub company of a bigger company who are just, who know that if they don't get that game like profitable to a certain level, they'll just get dropped or they'll get moved on. Or they'll get, if they, and sometimes, well, if they do get successful, they'll basically get like swallowed up by the, the master company. Things like this happen, oh, no, not just a gaming thing. This is anything where licensing exists or, or anything of that nature. So it's it's really quite complex. Now, I, I realise that Battletech is owned by Tops, And Tops is, a, as far as I'm aware, I mean, Tops is very much a US company. I don't, I don't really see them in the UK. But they're a huge company. And, I'm, I mean, 
I'm not naive. They'll very much be interested in the bottom line of what Battletech is delivering. I'm sure that they pressure the people at Catalyst for that. But it does seem on like face value that because they do a well, they do a very good job actually, I'd imagine, in, in terms of profitability at the moment. And I'm sure that they have some kind of like long term plan for this. So Tops have given it to them to kind of get off life support and get up and running again. And then who knows what will happen in the future? You know, is that going to lead to like more exciting projects or you know, like modern media things? Like, I mean, I don't say for things like films and TV shows because I think the Battletech IP is really quite complex. So I don't know if that could ever happen. But I think there is a, an opportunity here, given that Battletech's got a a very solid like history and law, and it's generally very good as well. I mean, I, you know, suppose this segues me on to one of my first points, really, because I've been reading um, from these two manuals recently. Um, these are the this, this is the Davian and the um, Capellan, uh, what's this, the Handbook and the Field Manual, and. The reason why it's it's kind of been important for me to get back into to reading these is because both of these were published in the early two thousands, so they very much include like the Word of Blake material, and I've basically been working my way through them for a, for a couple of months. I bought maybe like twenty five like technical readouts and manuals, but these are the two that I've kind of like really started to delve into because. My area of Battletech, the bit that I love the most, is kind of the um, the border line, what is known as the Capellan March between like House Davian and um, the the Capellans. That's just where my jam is, <laughs> you know. So like it, and that's I, I do have like a real soft spot for like the Taurians as well, and the Taurians are like on that. It's like a triple border between all three. It's where my like mercenary outfit, uh, sorry, mercenary outfit uh, operate in the Capella March. So, if I ever did when I was a when I was younger, used to play like BattleTech narrative, it would always be in that area. So it makes sense, therefore, that these are the two books that I gravitate towards in the first instance. And I can, it's it's a very interesting thing when you're going through them that you can see like the dynamism and the the art and the oh, I don't know how to like. There's just so much excitement when you get like into that 3025 era and you've got all those classic mechs and everything just seems again I've got my biases on this because that's the era that I kind of know the best with that and the clan invasion as well but as soon as you kind of get past that and you I think it all starts really in the um, as soon as you get like to the end of the the Fedcom Civil War which is in around like 3067 it really falls off a cliff. I think you can just see it falls off a cliff. And I'm not just talking about like the word of Blake as a thing, right? That's I'll deal with that when we get into this discussion and the controversial elements that I'm going to bring up. But I think the it's it's if you look at Battletech as really quite an interesting like universe in that they've got a lot of things going on with like the geopolitics between the houses and the periphery and then eventually the clans and the history that they're all involved with but there's also very much if you want to be crass about it it is all about the mechs right like i i, I don't imagine anyone's getting drawn into battletech for any other thing than that the i don't know the warhammer looks cool or the awesome looks awesome or the the catapult just has this really distinctive like World War Two bomber, like um, cockpit with with these giant missile launchers attached to it. I mean, it just looks very, very unique and weird. And I know that you know. I mean, this is a very I think famous thing in Battletech. There's been lots of like lawsuits between companies suing each other because mechs were stolen or designs were perceived to be stolen. I, I don't know any of the legalities around it, but I think there was a big like hoo ha that um, that resulted in lots of weird and wonderful things happening with Battletech over the years, which I certainly didn't know about as a kid. And as I've kind of got older and, and looked into that a little bit, I thought I've, I've not, I, I don't know enough to talk about it. I'm sure there are other videos on YouTube or uh, there's like a history of it somewhere, which go into it. If you're interested in that, I'm personally not. I mean, you know, I, I work in law and I actually know some of the best like IPT, that's intellectual property and trademark 
uh, lawyers in the world. Um, and um, so I know a bit about that, but I'm not interested about it in regards like the the love that I have for BattleTech. Like it's it's a historical thing, and now I think it's all kind of cleared up, and everyone knows like the direction that they're going in. So the mechs become like a, a, a basically a sales pitch, right? Like if you are a I don't know, like a fourteen year old kid, and you are looking um, in a store. I mean, like the 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 new Catalyst game. Um, like mechs where they're in those like really sleek little packages you, you can just see them on like toy shop floors right like you can just see them up in stock which is great I mean that's what you really need to go for they need to be in your like for the American audience is it Barnes and Noble or Walmart you know you need them on those shelving or on those shelves sorry so you know like it they're your sales pitch if a kid sees that and thinks wow that looks really cool uh, and then they kind of, I don't know, I mean, if you look on the back of the packaging or whatever, or I think there's some like dioramas when you open the packaging and there's kind of, it shows you how these things can look if you paint them and, you know, they, they look really awesome. And it's quite easy to play because you can pick up the, like the hex maps with the, like the core game. And the mechs, I think, the, this is where I think Battletech really starts to fall off a cliff, is that the mechs just become so, like, they're not boring. I mean, a mech can never really be, I don't think, be boring, but it's like the design emphasis changes on them. And I think all those classic sleek designs just basically go away. As soon as you kind of get to the uh, word of Blake, it just seems to me like they're either rehashing old designs or the new designs that they're making just don't look, don't have the character that like the early models have. And I think that's a massive, massive problem for, for the game, actually, because at no point have I been reading through these two books and thinking, oh, you know, I really want to play with one of these, like, Word of Blake things or situations or whatever. It's I, I always just get, I get to those, like, sections and paragraphs, and I'm just like, this is, this is bad. And the reason why I think it's bad, in all honesty, really, is because... In any gaming system or book or narrative or anything else, you only really get one opportunity to go crazy, right? So, like, I'm just trying to think of it in terms of a, a, a like a TV show or a film that, that a lot of people will have seen. And I think just off the top of my head, if you read, like, um, George R. George R. R. Martin's books, you know, like A Song of Ice and Fire, like... He has the, um, I'm not talking about the TV show, that's a different thing altogether entirely, and we, they still don't know what's going to happen in the books, really. But the whole situation with, like, the uh, the White Walkers, like, above the wall, it's, it, George R. Martin's good at this. Like, he understands how to use tension, right? So that just that permeates throughout all of the books that have, you know, yet been published, which is there is a threat north of the wall... We kind of don't know what it is, but we know it's there. And eventually, you kind of know that it, something's going to happen, right? So they kind of sh they showed their hand in the TV show. And I think it's there's inevitability, inevit inevitably going to be a situation where, like, Daenerys comes back and up to Westeros and um, fights the good fight against the undead walkers, or the, the white walkers. But George R. R. Martin can't show his hand on that. Right, like it's it's imperative to what he is doing, that that tension is like the underlying current of, of and driving the narrative to a lot of extents. And in your mind, when you are reading those books, it's always like this is eventually going to go like like a powder keg. It'll just explode, and then everything that we are seeing here will you know white will become black, and we'll be through the looking glass really when we when we're into that new narrative, and. The clan invasion was that moment for Battletech, right? Like, that was it. That was the one thing. And it was able to do that, because I think if you read... I'm not talking about these particular books. Like, these are relatively new in Battletech terms. I think this one's 2007. Yep, 2007, and this one is 2000. The Capellan was 2000. I did get a book, though, from um, the Periphery book, which is downstairs. And I read through some of that, and that's a very early book. That's like a uh, like a mid eighties book. And when I was reading through that, they, I was no, there's a few, it was a preferred book, and there's another book I've got as well. I can't remember which one it is. It might be the the first role playing book, 
Now I don't role play, but I wanted the books just because I want to be able to read through them for the like the law sections. So it might have been that one actually. Um, it probably was because it had like a, an overview of the like the BattleTech universe. And as I was going through that, you can very much see that they're setting it up for the the clan invasion. Not no one knows the clan invasion because no the the word clan is never uttered. Like between whatever it was, nineteen eighty six, and uh, or you know, whenever the game really started to take off, I think nineteen eighty six is seen as it's one of its like key years. So I th I'm sure at that point when they were getting more publications in and things were like the ball was like or the the BattleTech world was getting more like momentum, they clearly made the choice that they wanted to do the clan thing as a like a version two of the game, which would be like a a huge event, which it, it was, you know, like you have these like, I don't know, quasi -bar barbarians who have got like historical context coming back into the universe and messing everything up. And I know at the time, also I've read this with hindsight, a lot of people hated it because the clans are like very overpowered. And I think a lot of people were upset by that. And I still think to this day that people weren't really keen in the direction that the clans went in. For me, I was way too young to know to have an opinion like for me that in fact i got into battletech when the clan invasion happened so i just thought it was it was part of the norm but if you'd been playing for like you know a decade previous you might have been thinking what on earth is this clan situation this is crazy you've ruined my tabletop game or whatever but to put it another way they pulled the trigger on that the one thing that they had hanging over the universe right and it was a very, very good way to do it because it had historical context. So if you read the early books, like the books that I mentioned there, like the uh, the role-playing books, they very much go into this, oh, there is an exodus and Kerensky disappears, you know, with the SLDF. And it's not just like, oh, he disappears with one ship and there's 300 people on it, right? They've it's like 6 million people with an untold amount of technology and weaponry and goodness knows what else disappeared into the you know the far galaxy or the outer periphery and were not heard from again so and again i know we've got hindsight and we can look back at this now because okay you can see what they were doing but it's very clear to me that someone in the kind of right in writing team had the idea of we'll just we'll eventually have this come back and and you know, destroy things and we can remake it, which is kind of what they did. And again, going back to the um, like the Song of Ice and Fire analogy, that's the that's what happens there, right? Like the 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 um, the White Walkers are like omnipresent throughout the the whole uh, book series, and eventually, you know, bang, it's going to pop. What George R. 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 Martin can't do is in book two as you know, um, Arya is lost in the wilderness and, um, you know, Daenerys is, um, like, picking up a little bit of momentum and she's got, like, the baby dragon. You can't have at that point, oh, there's a massive uh, white walker invasion and everyone kind of has to stop and think what they're doing while half of the world gets ravaged. And then in book six, oh, there's another white walker invasion, right? Like, it just... you can, you can You've got to have, like, really, really, like... A good sense of timing when it comes to like your narrative and when you can pull the trigger and you can get away with it but it's got to have context and i think context is the key word and the con inversion has context because the kerensky thing is like the ultimate um like conspiracy theory or the ultimate mystery in in battle tech and then it gets answered and they didn't do it within like a year of the game coming out they did it after it was like a decade when they pulled the trigger on it and it becomes very much like intertwined and there's a connectivity between like the start of the Battletech universe which I think you probably would say is like the Star League um oh, you, the argument states before that you could say it's like you know when they develop the technology that that we all know and love in in Battletech but um, I think you'd say the Star Leagues, if you're playing tabletop, you'd probably, if you're going to play like the earliest era, I can't, I'm, I'm sure there are people who play like, you know, the first decade that the Mac is invented. But I think for me, I'd be, if I ever went back that far, I'd probably want to do the Star League stuff. That could be cool. You know, like um, the, the when the um, SLDF fought the periphery powers and stuff like that. 
but then you've got this like so you've got the tie then between that era and the clan invasion and everything else like into uh, intertwines like all the inner sphere houses and the periphery powers and everything else so you pull that trigger you do your thing now you can then argue until the sun goes down about whether the clans are a good thing whether it was too weird like and wonderful you know like the the way that they came back and what the clans actually are and what they represent is that like overshooting the mark that's a, a debate for another time for me personally i think it's fine i mean i would imagine if you had um like two societies separated for that long and they'd gone through quite a lot of trauma you know in terms of what the clans went through they were you know they had like um long memories and i suppose that given that the, you know they were the lost tribe so to speak so they might have like they it's very probable that they went into weird and wonderful directions like culturally in fact you i'd probably argue not enough like you know, I mean, the worlds that they kind of eventually populated were not exactly like Gardens of Eden. So they probably would have come back even more like Mad Max crazy people than, than what they actually were. I mean, it's kind of a miracle that they that you do have clans like, like Ghost Bear, who are still relatively cool. Um, you, you, I mean, even like, like Smoke Jaguar, who I think are the kind of most evil of all evil clans. I mean, you'd probably say that it, what they could have been could have been far far worse um and they are the antagonists of the story right like you can i know there's a lot of like edge lords out there who are like you know you, you're the, the type of people who like cheer for the bad guys in the movies or choose uh, cheer for like heels in wrestling matches and stuff like that because it's so edgy to do that obviously um i think you've you've got the you might have a similar kind of thing with um some clan players as well like yeah you know we're just going to smash things up and that's fine. I mean, it's a game, so cool. You know, I think at one time or another, if you've done gaming, you've always played the bad guy, right? Or you, just to see what happens. Um, it doesn't all have to be, like, noble bright. But I think the clans are very much there as a narrative, like, plot device to really push the whole, like, these are the big antagonists, and now the Inner Sphere is going to have to kind of band together, which didn't really happen. I mean, I remember in the cartoon, that's from the early 90s, or mid-90s, that's how it was pitched it was like Karita and Fedcom who were very very age-old enemies having to kind of fight together against the clans and this new like uh, antagonist that was was on the horizon but to go back to point on why the clans worked why did the clan thing work why did the um word of word of Blake fail it's because the word of Blake in my opinion is an incredibly lazy plot device it, you pull the trigger twice on something that's um, very, very similar to the clan invasion in some respects. It's just, I suppose you'd, you'd say it's an internal thing to the inner sphere as opposed to the external. But, you know, basically it's like a cult. We're making um, these mechs in wherever, and then they just decided to go and take over. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so bizarre. I mean, I... If I, I think if I was looking at that, and I know there's, there are gaming elements to this, right? So it's like they wanted to be able to create a new system of conflict which could sell more gaming products and more mechs, things like that. So I get why they've done that. But I think from a narrative point of view, it just seems to me, it's like I said, you've tried to pull the trigger twice. And the second time you've pulled the trigger, you know, we know what you're going to do. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the word of Blake was the start of what you, no pun intended, you probably would say the dark age of Battletech where it had its like core base, but I can't imagine it was it was very profitable. I think that all led to very, very weird and wonderful like narrative choices. And again, I, I need to put my biases on the table here and say, I don't know them. I've not read them. I've only kind of understood them on a peripheral level. I am sure that there are good things in there. You know, I'm sure that there's like a really good book written for, you know, Word of Blake or somewhere or this, you know, there are some mechs that look cool. But when you put in like, there are some things against, you go back to like the 1325 era when the either the computer games or the tabletop or the mech designs, there's nothing that I don't like, right? And I... I'm trying to be object. I don't think it's because I've got some like nostalgia thing to this. Yeah, like I'm not. 
I just, I, ju- I'm talking, just trying to be objective on like the aesthetic of what's going on. The catapult is just a really, really cool looking mech. It's got such a uniqueness to it. I see like the word of Blake stuff, it all looks very flat. And I don't know, there's something about it. I just can't, I'm not looking at it thinking, oh, I'd love to be able to buy and paint that mech. It just, it just doesn't have the same resonance. Now, let's, so that's my, that's my kind of, that's the problem as I see it, is that, you know, that second pulling of the trigger, which clearly didn't work. So what do we do now? Where are we now in the kind of, the grand scheme of things in Battletech? There has been this resurgence. So let's just go back and, and have a little bit of a, like a stock analysis of, of where we currently are in terms of what they're doing. So, and I, if you look at the two things that I think have really given the resurgence to, to Battletech over the last few years, and that's, to me, is the Hairbrain Scheme game, and obviously the, the Catalyst Games um, Kickstarter. I don't, think, I don't think anyone would dispute that. I don't think anything else comes close to those two factors in this um again i know that people have uh, there will be people out there who are critics of the kickstarter or the new mech designs or um like the hairbrain schemes game but i think they've they've just got their they understand that line to walk between your avid fan base and getting new fans and i think both sides of that like it's not an argument but both sides of that dynamic have to have some kind of respect and appreciation like the the people who like the hardcore fan base can't just have what they want all the time. It's, it is going to have to get a little bit more watered down. Otherwise it's very difficult to attract new fans. And likewise, people, new people coming into the, the gaming system have to have respect for, for what is there. It's kind of a, a dual process. And like I said, I can't help it to give my opinion to, to what I think they should do now, but in in no by no means is it like a hill that I would be willing to die on, right? It's just an opinion as I see it, as my kind of experiences with BattleTech goes, and having read through now quite a lot of the literature and the books and 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 things like that. So I think the 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 if we're going to go back to problems for a second, because there are several problems that I foresee. So again, just to clarify, the first one was the pulling of the trigger twice. Um, the second one is that I think when they when they jump forward in time, they jump forward far too far. So like you'll go from like um, so post um, like the um, the word of Blake. I don't. It's like every few years they're just like grasping at straws, and it's like oh we'll now have the Dark Age or the Republic, and it and this I say these words, but they don't mean anything to me because I think in context. I don't think, I think only the hardcore fans are involved in that. I think if you're coming back to Battletech now, you'll be very much where I'm sitting, which is, well, all I really care about is either, you'll have people who are into Succession Wars, Clan Invasion, or the Fedcom Civil War, or all three, or a variety of those three. I happen to be into all three of those, but I look at anything post-Fedcom Civil War and just think, not interested at all. And that then becomes a little bit of an existential crisis for Battletech, because... If I'm not interested in anything that came after like 30, 3068, sir, and I think now the current like um, law is set in about 3150, so it's like 100 years after the clan invasion. So you have to ask yourself then, am I necessarily going to be into anything that they do post 3150? And I'm afraid the answer to that has to be no. Because I can't, there's going to be a black hole of a hundred years where they've written a lot of literature and, and everything else that I've got no interest in. And correct me if I'm wrong, is anyone else interested in this if you have if you are coming back to Battletech now? I'm sure if you've been playing Battletech for, for years and years, you've or if you've kind of been passively um, in and out of it for like 30 years, then you probably do think, oh yeah, well, I know enough about that and I did like these couple of things. But I'm talking about like, if you look at it as like a marketable product that you can sell and that you can develop and that you can grow, like wh- where do you, where is your focus going to be? And I think if you look back, I mean, just the proof's in the pudding, right? Look at the, the, th- the things that have been done to get Battletech out, off of life support over the last couple of years. The Hairbrain Scheme games was very much a Succession Wars game. It was set in around 3025. The Kickstarter, the first Kickstarter, was very much a Succession Wars thing. And 
it didn't have an era as such it was it was multiple era but you could argue that it went like it was succession wars because of the mechs that we were getting and then obviously they did the clan invasion and that's um like the you know the 30 50 era around then and I've said this before, I said this on the first video that I recorded, I just don't think that they'll do the chronological thing anymore, and I think I've made another video talking about that in a little more depth in, in what they should do in terms of the like the um, the next Kickstarter that they're going to do. And again, you, you then have to ask, and this is a real conundrum, especially for Catalyst, who I think are the like the um, the, the custodians of all the, the lore and the books that are going out at the moment, they must be having that discussion now saying you know like our sales for like the new stuff that we're putting out is really limited and disappointing when you compare that to like the demand that's that people have for like succession war stories or for clan invasion stories but there's a i think there is a this is where the controversy comes in i think there is a hardcore element of fans who are really invested in the story who are kind of driving the um I say like the gaming narrative to want more and I think that is a mistake for Catalyst to engage in because the general rule of thumb is that you never play to the house right you always leave people wanting more and again this is controversial but this is my what I'm building up to here with all the mistakes that have been made I think of the last like say 15 years with Battletech they need to cut their losses and i think they need to have like an acknowledgement almost that everything post fedcom civil war is a little bit of a write-off and it's not going to get anyone back into the game it's not going to draw any fans back in so the question then is what do you do so your options are to retcon everything and that's not something i think ever should be done because how can you do that? And as well, you can, well, you first of all, you can't do it in BattleTech because BattleTech has got such a a history of not retconning. You know, they've they very much they don't do that for the gaming rules. They don't do that for weird and wonderful things that appear in the universe. I usually see quite clever ways of how they incorporate that into you know into story arcs. So you're not just going to retcon. You can't say oh, the word of blight never happened. We're just going to kind of draw a line on after Fedcom Civil War and see where we're then at. You can't do that, right? Like, it would be daft to do that as well. But I think my opinion is really that they need to stop pushing the universe timeline forward. And again, I think that might be controversial, especially to like hardcore fans, because you're going to want to know like what happens after like the Ilkhan era, and you know what happens in you know thirty three hundred or whatever. But that's something that. A company will pander to to some extent but ultimately this is a gaming system for one and the second and the most important point is that the interesting part of it has already happened and that's what people are engaged in so my way of thinking on this would be don't retcon just don't develop anymore so acknowledge that the word of Blake is eventually a thing and that the dark age is a thing and etc etc but now go back and really kind of flesh out and develop that era between you don't have to do 3025 it can be before that you can do like i don't know 2980 to 3067 and keep your options and everything that you're going to be doing on that in terms of like publications and uh, gaming systems and computer games and everything else keep it in that setting and whatever the clamor is for we, we want we want to find we want to do a word of blake thing just ignore it right like i can categorically tell you as a very vanilla person in gaming and as a fan of battle tech if it's if i think this you can probably put your money on it that other people will think this we're not interested Right, and ultimately, you might have like say ten percent. I'm I'm just put that figure out there. It will be a small percentage of people will be really interested in the new stuff, but people want succession wars, clan invasion, Fedcom civil war, and I think there's so the great thing about BattleTech. Like if you look, if you kind of correspond it to like forty k, it's a really small galaxy, right? Like forty k is just ridiculously huge and sprawling whereas Battletech's much more contained 
But even as a contained universe, you're still talking about like hundreds upon hundreds of like star systems, presumably tens of thousands of planets. You can flesh things out a little bit as well. I mean, you can talk about the, you know, just because it's not being written about or there's some contradi- contradictory things that are going on doesn't mean that you can't flesh it out. I mean, I, I, I'll give you an example of this. I think this is where a lot of the fans go wrong. And I saw this on a a thread um, a while ago. On, on I, I can't remember what it was. It was probably on Steam. It was probably something to do with our brain schemes. And someone had asked a question in there, like, what, this Oregon thing, obviously it didn't happen, right? Like, because uh, we know, we didn't read about it ever in, you know, it's kind of just come along. And it was before, it was kind of a, a white, uncharted bit of the map, right? Like, there was a couple of star systems there, but no one really bothered about it. It was kind of the the bit of space between, like, um, where the Taurians are and where the Magistracy of Canopus is. And no one really knew about it. And I, it was one of the comments on there which made me laugh was, well, it obviously all fell apart after 3033 because reasons, and then presumably went on to list lots of law reasons why it wasn't. And I can't get into that mindset, right? I, I just, I, I didn't comment. I would never start an argument with someone on the internet. Not that that would be an argument. It'd be much more a debate. I think we're a Battletech fan. But you've got to kind of credit it with the fact that the galaxy is a big place and not every story has been told. So the Oregon Reach thing might be something that they, it's a well that they can keep drawing back from because it's a very prominent um, famous in terms of the Battletech universe because of the High Brain Scheme game. So everyone knows now that there is a, a little kingdom and quite a, an interesting kingdom and, and in, a kingdom that's got like aspirations to a periphery power that likes the Star League. Wow. Like, that's quite interesting, right? Like if you had like, uh, what's her name? Is it Camille Arano? I think her name is the, the protagonist in, um, in the High Brain Scheme game. If you kind of built something in with what happened to her, like, uh, dynasty, like, did they eventually, um, like, go to war with the Taurians again? Did they get swallowed up by the Magistracy of Canopus? Uh, you know, did they go to war with the Capellans? Uh, did they form an alliance with the Capellans? Like, you know, there's lots of interesting... There's a, a thousand books you could tell on that, right? I mean, it's not... that's And that's just one tiny area of space that you can flash out. And, you know, and, and I think that's where the creativity thing should start to spark if you know you've got that area that people are interested in there's so much that you can tell it's such a rich universe there's so many you know there are so many things going on there that you can that you can flesh out like i'm sure that like on the on the other side of the galaxy like up by the uh, like where the lyran commonwealth is and you know they'll have periphery powers in and around them, or maybe they had like a, a world that rebelled against them, or you know like there are just there's so much that you can do, but I think sometimes as fans as well, you know we've got to be really careful about what we wish for, and this has never been brought back more than at the moment when you've got a lot of old IPs being like rehashed into new formatted, whether it's television shows or films. And the best example off the top of my head is like the new Star Wars films, which I very much see as like uh, fan-made fiction. All right, that, that's just what they are. The first one, not so much. The first one's just like a rehash of A New Hope. But as you're going on, I, I get that it's almost like the, the, the writers, the people involved in it, the directors, it's like they're making the Star Wars film that they want. Right, because either they're big Star Wars fans or the the production team has got their idea on what needs to be done. Well, that'll have been Disney, obviously. So you've got this like this dynamic going on, which isn't necessarily something that people were doing when they were creating these IPs. It was how do we tell the best story that we can tell with the you know the rules of the universe that we're going to give ourselves. And I think again, it's 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 on us really as fans to let them have the room to breathe to tell their stories in the bits that we like it's that there's that dynamic we like 30 25 to 30 67 or say we should say i but i'm sure there's a lot of people watching this video that agree with me um and then we allow them to kind of flesh that out and we don't go back to them and start screaming and moaning every time there's some kind of contradictory thing that goes on because they can just say it as, look, it's a big universe. There's a lot of propaganda and there's a lot of politics. And maybe this thing was just like swept under the carpet. Oh, sorry, swept under the carpet and was completely ignored. 
Um, or I mean, they do that in Battletech. Like Battletech, the, the one thing I really love about Battletech, I love a lot of things about it, but the one thing that stands out amongst any, any, everything in there is that the people that wrote it have a real understanding of propaganda and marketing, right? So, like, and they reflect that in everything they do in the gaming system. Like the fact you get mechs that are just garbage. But it's really fun to get mechs that are garbage because it gives a whole different element to the game. Like, why did someone think it was good to create the charger, right? Like, a, you know, an assault mech that has five small lasers. <laughs> it's this tiny, like, I mean, there are, any light mech will pack a, like, a harder punch than the charger. But someone, somewhere, for some bizarre reason, probably some marketing guru who got the wrong end of the stick when he got the report back decided to create the charger and i really like that about but i like that there's that like that human error isn't just a a high-end thing like oh yeah look this is it's grim dark and you know there's these people these powerful people with like unscrupulous and manipulating the um their populaces and you know it's very dark and and grim You've also got the... Yeah, there's a lot of incompetence here as well. There's a lot of stupidity. And that's what happens. Look at any company through history. You will see, like, high points and low points and, like, marketing campaigns that literally destroy a product or that can elevate a product from, like, nobody knowing what it is to everybody knowing what it is within a month. You know, so the, that... Battletech has got such a grounded reality to it. And in a sense, you can then formulate like a very extravagant um, like law system on the grounds that like, well, you know, I don't know. Like, let's say you were doing like the, there was a, an insurrection against the Taurians, right? And the Taurians are quite a proud people and they're very much in the Battletech terms, like they um, are seen as one of the, they're a minor power, but they're still, they're a major force in the periphery and the certainly give the Davians a lot to think about. But if they had an insurrection, that would be odd, right? Because you'd be like, well, surely they're all, like, loyal. And they are, like, you know, they've all got one common enemy, in, but it's, like, what was the Star League or the Inner Sphere? But if you flesh it out, say, actually, no, there was an insurrection, but the government in the Taurians suppressed it, and nobody knows that much about it, but we're going to tell you the story now, right? Like, that, that's the mindset I think the fans have to get in. And then to cater to that if we can give catalyst and or anyone else who's got the ip that they can then rehash and sell us back what we want which is content in the for want of a better term the classic era which most people play that again proofs in the pudding pudding look at the game games when they are uh, what eras they're in are they doing word of blake era games no will they do them i doubt it you know, maybe I'll be proved wrong. Maybe they might do like a rehash or a reha a rewrite of Word of Blake and, you know, say something like, oh, well, the whole, the initial story that was told was just a fabricated lie told by, you know, um, like the propaganda wing of the, of Comstar or something like that. Actually, this is the real story. Like, like I said, if you keep that flexibility to your IP and you have that notion that there are like um, you know unreliable narrators going on in the universe all the time, and you, so there you do. Except retconning is to me never a good thing. I think once it's out there and it's it's like art in general, right? Like art, once art is created, and I'm not talking about ignore the monetary thing here. Once art is created and it's out in the public domain, it is no longer the artist's, right? Like it's it kind of transcends what the artist was trying to do and the artist can obviously always claim the creation of what he or she has created but they can't stop what it gets turned into and sometimes that can be good sometimes that can be terrifying right so just look at Wagner who's the you know the 19th century composer like I'm not you know I'm not a big classical music buff I know a little bit about classical music but I've got friends who are really into classical music and most classical musicians love Wagner, like they just love his style. But it was a, you know, a system and of music, and you know the kind of the great works of Wagner were really like hijacked by the Nazis, and um, it's always had like a really dirty like connotation to it since then. That wasn't Wagner's fault, right? I'm not talking about Wagner as a man or whatever he believed. It's just he created something that something else hijacked. 
and you know it turns sour and you've got things that happen in the reverse like uh, you know works of art that inspire an entire um not just a generation of people but the species right so you you can just look back at these throughout history our, our works of art that go on to create actual like technological advancements or medical advancements i mean i i, I say quite often that like if the sci-fi writers like you know asimov and you know philip k dick people like that who were writing like back in the 60s have built the modern world right you know the the tech engineers and the scientists who were around in the you know developing things in the 80s and 90s they were reading those works in college and then that's what that you know that look at like the mobile phone right you know like it they couldn't have even conceived that. Like even in the sixties, even the most like ambitious sci-fi writer couldn't have kind of come up with what we have now. But it comes from art. You know, it's it's it comes from the imagination, the spark of imagination in in a human being's mind, or in maybe it's a collective thing, several human beings' mind that then makes its way into like popular culture, and like bang, you've got you know this massive um, jump forward or this progress or whatever else, and. I'm going a little bit off topic there. But, you know, like, you, you've you still got to, you know, going back to Battletech, like, I think Catalyst especially now have to have those, like, tough discussions on what they want to do next. And, like, personally, like, if they turn around and said, well, we never want to do anything outside of um, Succession Wars up to Fedcom Civil War again, and we're going to keep in that era, I'm sure there'd be a lot of, you know, gnashing of teeth and wailing but they'll get over it because it's not like they're saying um we're going to wreck on it we're going to destroy it it's like it exists and i think they've kind of they've been able to draw a line under it with the ilkan thing right like that was the um i suppose like the end point where the clans actually did get i think that's what I mean, i've not read it but i think that's kind of the gist of it that um the clans eventually do do what they always wanted to do and that's to get earth so, you know, you can kind of say, okay, well, that's the thing. This is the kind of, if in a historical, in a future historical context, that is what happens. But we've, we're just going to leave that there. And if people are interested, they can read it. There, there are still mechs, you know, that you can buy for it, etc. But we are going to sit within the confines of the area of Battletech that we know and that most of the fans are into and that we know that we can market and sell. We know that we can do computer games for that and people will play it. And it resonates beyond Battletech fans. I mean, I've got lots of um, at least three like friends who know what Battletech is just from playing like Mech Warrior. And when I say, oh, you know, it's a tabletop game as well, they're like, oh, I didn't know that. They thought it was just a, um, you know, like a, a computer concept game, but they don't know it came from a, you know, it was a tabletop game first and a role playing game and then computer games got developed to it for it in the 90s. So that's my like relatively controversial view, I'd say on on this that um, that I thought I'd share, and I, I kind of wanted to get that out as well because it's something that I be I have been thinking about a lot when I've been thinking about BattleTech and reading it, and I tried to come at it from an objective standpoint. I didn't go into it thinking, oh, I'm just not going to read anything that that happened in the Word of Blake, but as I was reading it, I could just see that like creative. Thing, just go and do a little bit of a, a crash and it's understandable because battle i think battletech had such high expectations and it was so good you know like the original writers of it the people that fleshed out the original like universe just made such a unique and i'm not talking about the maximum i'm talking about the actual conception of the whole thing there's just so much going on in terms of like the powers and the politics and you know, then you kind of get into the mech side of it. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not a big, I'm much more a narrative focused player than I would be like uh, engineer. Like I'm not looking at the mechs and like salivating. With, oh, look at the size of that thing's PPC or something like that. Like I just, you know, for me that is cool and it's secondary. What I really like in Battletech are the, uh, all the fluffy elements for it and all the kind of little idiosyncrasies that all the li little different powers have the minor powers and the inner sphere powers and the clans and I also I think it's a very smart IP as well I think there's a lot of um it's some I'll quickly talk about this and I'll end the video because we're coming up to uh, to an hour now but one of the main issues that I have with modern media and modern especially film and, and television is that they really kind of hit you over the head with um 
like political analysis, which to me is just a really stupid mistake to do. Like if you go back and watch seventies films, particular, in particular, like seventies films are brutal, right? But and they never hit you over the head, right? It's always like there. There's so much deep led messaging and symbolism going on in a lot of 70s films that you don't see now because the writers are unable to do it. Writers kind of act on this like peripheral level or this surface deep level. And it's such a shame because I think that an art way, it should make you think. You should have to fight and work to find its message, right? And that message, like in 70s films, even in like the most brutal films, a film like Taxi Driver, right? Which is a horrifying film. But there are so many like um, critiques on modern life in there that still hold up today, right? You know, like how the character um, kind of falls into this like web of darkness and sees redemption in it through the most bizarre thing. Like it, it's a, it's. I mean, I think it's a bit of a masterpiece. It's Taxi Driver, but like. Battletech isn't a million miles away from that. Like the things going on in Battletech in that period, from you know, like I said, the Succession Wars up to the the Fedcom Civil War, and it gets a bit hammier as you go on. But I'm talking about like the intrinsic, like um, like the you know what's going on in the inner sphere and the periphery. It's deep, you know. It's very very deep, and there's a there's a lot of like subtext to that. Like, and at, at surface, you know, you can just say, oh well, it's you know, like the uh, House Davian are just like knights in space, and the Capellans are just crazy communists, and you know the Koreans are like on a bound Japanese feudalists. But there's a critique in that of, you know, like almost like futurism. For instance, like, and it's it's really interesting how all the societies regress back from democracy to what we were kind of engaged with in the Middle Ages. So because Korea are like a Japanese civilization on the whole, they revert back to Japanese feudalism. And, like, the Davians re- re- reverse back to, um, like, monarchy, like a Western style of monarchy. So it's very, very weird. But that kind of, it, that, like, reverse engineering on what happens is a really interesting, um, like, parable, I think, for what could happen if we are not careful. So, it, and it, like I said, it, on surface, it looks, it just looks like a gaming system. But I, the people that have written this, you know, the people who were kind of, um, really kind of fleshing out this, um, the fluff early on would, and I think I know this from stuff that I've read about them but they were certainly people who had been in war I mean you can see that because of the horrors of war are, are like omnipresent throughout Battletech and I think in a sense like the whole concept of mech combat which is quite an honourable system is, is basically a system to try and stop collateral damage to um, civilian populaces so I think in a sense it's someone who's been through war and seen the horror and the terror of war being able to say, look, you can still have a militaristic system and concepts of honour, but you don't have to murder, you know, to do it. And I do. That's why I think the mechs, the, the mech warriors especially, are so interesting because they are like the knights errant of their day, you know, of, in, in the future. And it, in a sense, it gives. It's it. It just it gives so much depth and interest, and I'm not going to talk about it much now for another video anyway because I'm coming up to an hour now. But you know, there's there is so much going on in BattleTech, and I I mean I can only look at it from my own perspective. That's what like draws me into it, like for sure is the the depth of the fluff. And I'm not I'm not talking about like the the fiction books or anything like that. Like I I honestly I'm not really interested in the fiction books. I've read a few of them. It's the source books because I, I you almost see it as like a future history battle tech. So when I pick up a source book and it's like flicking through a, um, you know, like a classics history book or something like what happened in ancient Syracuse between this day and this day. That's kind of what's going on in the battle tech universe. But instead you have these really cool mechs and you know the geopolitics going on. So, but again, where does that have interest to us? Well. For me as well, and I'll make this final point and then I'll wrap up, the reason why like the Succession Wars are so popular and so interesting is because it's basically a new version of the Renaissance. Right? Like the end of the Succession Wars is a a really interesting time in Battletech because they're starting to like figure out what the ancestors were actually really good at and they're able to develop that technology a little bit again. But it's not just technology, it's political science and 
and political theory and economics and you know there's like there's clearly like a movement in society to say we can be far better than we actually are here so let's try and pick our game up and that's why i really like the um the game from um hairbrain schemes because i felt they got that perfectly you know that kind of it's clearly very Mad Maxy in context, right? Like that particular part of the universe in the periphery is really quite grim dark. But there's that like that ray of light, which is um, like the the Iran the Iran and I can't remember it now. It's the Restoration, anyway. And they are like saying, actually, we can kind of do what the Star League wanted. We need to fulfill that promise. We need a you know a better society and a better civilization for people. That's really interesting, right? And that's where, you know, like, I know there's war going on, there's conflict and everything else, but the underlying kind of dynamic that's going on there, which then kind of becomes fulfilled when they get the Helm uh, memory car in, what is it, 3028, and then, you know, they start to develop technology, and then, bang, the clans hit. And you've got this, like, that's where the, like I said, everything kind of ties together, and there's this, like... um like I said, there's a, there's a very clear like lineage in the story about what's going on, and that's super interesting. The word of Blake was just some guys got like cult fever and decided to break things, and it's you're just like what like what, what's where's the kind of where's the depth to this? This is just you're just trying to cash in on like clan invasion two, and it's not going to wash. Anyway. I shall leave that um, video here. So hopefully that wasn't too controversial for you. Um, it's a, a topic I think that could be um, up, for, up for a lot of debate, actually. Um, and there'll be lots of thoughts on it. Share your thoughts on it. Speak to other Battletech community members about it. Um, we can do this as adults. You know, Nobody has to kind of lose sleep over this or tear lumps out of each other. Um, I would be super interested, you know, if, if there are people out there that completely vehemently disagree with this and think like the word of Blake is like the pinnacle of the, the Battletech IP. I'd love to, I'd love to hear that as a, a theory. Actually, that would be super interesting because obviously that different point of view might change my point of view. So let's, um, going forward, I might start, you know, in these vlogs, I might start to flesh that out, especially as I start to learn more about the period of history that I don't have much knowledge of. Anyway, coming right up to an hour now, so I will stop this video and I will thank you very much for watching and I'll hopefully catch you again next time.